Okay, um, hello everybody. Uh, thanks for coming. And um, there's nothing I can talk uh, tell you for uh, the organizatorial stuff today, so I'll just get right into it. Um, this talk is by Michel Löw, um, and he'll talk to you about the ethics of uh, web development. He's with Typo3 for, uh, since 2015, and he's uh, a scuff master for Punkt.de. So thank you very much, and give a big hand for him. Hi, everybody. <laughs> thank you for coming. Didn't expect to see so many people for such an obscure topic. Um, actually, I'm not a scuff master. I'm a scrum master, but that's fine, I guess. Um, I am, however, actually a designer, <laughs> so I kind of came to development and Scrum and everything on, on weird back routes and a lot of Type of 3 events finally made me do this. Um, uh, that's, that's my name, uh, that's my Twitter handle if you want to talk to me after, this is really bad, um, if you want to talk to me afterwards, if you want to ask questions or anything, you can do that afterwards or you can just shoot me a message on Twitter, I'll try to, to answer to all your Okay, we'll try it like that. Um, just a, uh, like a, a short disclaimer. Um, what I'm going to be talking about today is my personal opinion. Um, I'm pretty sure lots of you have different opinions on the stuff I talk about. Um, we can talk about that. I'm happy to discuss everything I'm going to be talking about today. There might be some swear words. I apologize in advance. There's going to be a couple of swear words on the slides. If you don't want to see them, just look away. Um, apart from that, I might mix up the terms developer and designer and engineer over the course of my talk. That is because I believe that we all try to solve the same problems. We all do the same stuff. We all are bound by the same ethics. And so I might be using those terms interchangeably. Don't worry about that. <laughs> Where do we come from? Um, we've been taught again and again and again and again as web developers and as designers to move fast and break things. This is actually a quote. As you might have guessed, it is not by Roadrunner. It's actually a quote from Mark Zuckerberg, the CEO of Facebook. You probably all know Facebook. You probably all used it. Um, and what this basically tells us is to to come up with ideas fast, to push things to production, to release products in a quick fashion, to reach as many people as we can. Um, it's all fine and dandy to work like that. Um, the problem is, when you're working fast and when you're breaking things, it just so happens that you sometimes break things. And over the course of moving fast and breaking things, I believe that we, as a web development and a tech community, at some point in time, pretty much fucked up. We moved fast, we broke things, and we didn't realize that the things we sometimes break are not products, but people. We, we're told to develop projects and to, to develop products, but we don't necessarily realize what the implications are. I have an example for you. I don't know, can you, can you read that? Um, this is a pop-up notification that showed up on people's Facebook profile. It tells you to update your name. This doesn't necessarily seem like a bad thing. It tells you, well, we've suspended your account because we want you to verify your name. We wanted to use your real name. Why did that appear? Uh, it just so turns out that Facebook at some point in time realized that they have about 86 million fake profiles on their platform. And coincidentally, when those news broke, Facebook's stock price tanked, and literally tanked. It dropped by $20 in one day when those news surfaced. So what did Facebook do? Well, they thought, oh, we have to do something about fake profiles. What can we do about fake profiles? Well. How about we make people use their real name? It seems like a fine idea. I mean, if you have a real name, you can verify that name. 
If you're really in doubt, you can ask for identification. You can ask people to send in photos of their passports. You can check their name. And from a business standpoint, that's actually, it's, it's a smart idea. They came up with it fast, they pushed it to production. They didn't realize what they were doing, though. Because having a real name is not as easy as it sounds. For one, there's people that come from different cultures, they have different types of names. They have last names that are just one letter because they're from some obscure Indian tribe. Um, Japanese names were a big problem for the system because they're different from the ones that Facebook was used to because they're an American company. And apart from obscure names, sometimes trying to define your own name is actually a, is actually a big problem. Imagine being in a body that doesn't necessarily reflect the gender that you want to have. You might want to change that. You might want to live the, the identity that you feel is right for you. And you might want to accompany that identity with a different name. It doesn't mean that you get this, this name put into your passport, maybe because you're not ready for it. But what Facebook wanted you to do is put your real name on there. And what they mean by real name is the name that's written in your passport. Um, this actually led to a bunch of people being forced off the platform because they weren't comfortable with publishing their birth name instead of the name that they want to have. That was one slide too much. Um, here's another example. This is the first tweet that was published on Twitter. It was in March 2006, uh, 2006. It was done by Jack. Jack, in this case, is Jack Dorsey, the current CEO of Twitter, Inc. This is 12 years later. Someone, some person, rather well-known, and I'm pretty sure you never thought that there could be a presentation about ethics without that guy, um, tweeted something about nuclear annihilation of North Korea. That's a slightly different tone. And this platform enables him to do that and to publish this message to a, a big group of people. I mean, Twitter has something like 400 million users, so they could all see that. What happened? What happened in those 12 years from some random guy publishing, oh, I just set up my Twitter. Actually, he spelled it without vowels. I don't know why. Um, what happened in those 12 years? And I thought about that a lot. And if you would have asked me a couple of years ago, what do you think about Twitter? I would have said something like, well, I use this platform to to further my business contacts, to get in touch with people from the same communities that I use. I use it a lot to get in touch with people from the Type 3 community. It's a great tool. But if you would have asked me today what I think about Twitter, it'd be something more along the lines of a platform that is able to transform hate, misogyny, fascism, and racism into a huge load of money for a couple of white dudes. Jack Dorsey, the guy from the first tweet right now, is worth 5.7 billion dollars. Milliarden for the Germans, not billion. Um, how did that happen? It happened somewhere along those 12 years. Somewhere in that, fr in that time frame, he made a fortune of 5.7 billion dollars. Um, and to understand what happened, we need to look at a different, or I want you to look at a different company. This company. What is Uber? Uber is, for one, a company that has a very big problem with rampant sexism in their uh, leader leadership structure, but I'm not going to talk about that. Um, what I'm going to talk about is what did they want to do? What did they want to do when they moved fast? They wanted to release a product. What was it for? And at its core, Uber is a tool that democratizes transportation. It's a very good thing. I mean, we have two groups of people. We have a group of people that has a resource, cars. We have another group that has a need, rides. And Uber went and connected those people, and they made some money along the way. It, it, it was a nice system. Everyone profited from it. They were a solid business. They had steady growth rates, uh, and everything was fine until something happened. They became greedy. 
Uber was filled up to the brink with venture capital. And don't get me wrong, I, I think venture capital is, is a necessary thing. It's a good thing for products. You can develop your projects better when you have more money. All of you know that. But what also happens when you get filled up with venture capital is that you get people in the room that have different motives than you. And for a company that is backed by venture capital, one of those big motives is a so-called liquidation event. Those people that put money into your company want to get that money back at some point in time because no one has free money to give, at least not many people, I guess. And what happened when Uber realized that they need to make more money in a shorter period of time, they started skimming on their ethics. They started lowering the, the bars for drivers. They started simplifying their background checks for drivers. And they started skimming on their hiring processes. They hired young devs, young designers, straight out of college to work for their company without ever thinking about what the moral implications were. They bent the laws to reach certain markets. And a very, very specific tool for that is called Grayball. Has anyone of you ever heard of Grayball? Grayball is a tool that Uber developed to detect whether you are a government official or not. They started tagging people, they started following people's uh, movement profiles, and when they thought that you might be a person that works for a city official, they just served you a different version of their app. Like, if I pull up my Uber app, I get cars, and I can book a ride, and then a driver comes, and they pick me up, and they, put me, they get me to where I want to go. But if you're a government official, for example, in Portland, where they did this extensively, you would get a different version of the app. They would show you a map with a lot of cars on them that weren't real. And whenever you tried to, to hail a ride, they would simply just not come. And this was all done in an effort to, um, to avoid controls and to avoid uh, officials from figuring out what you're doing. What they in fact did is they, suffer, uh, they, they sacrificed their ethics for short-term gains to reach that liquidation event for the venture capitalists. So what happened at Twitter? Is it the same thing? Not so sure about that. I mean, Twitter is obviously venture capital backed. They need money. It's fine. This is an excerpt from Twitter's terms of service. And the interesting part is this part. Safety. You may not threaten violence against an individual or a group of people. We also prohibit the glorification of violence. Learn more about our blah, blah, blah. This sounds nice. But didn't we just read some guy threatening nuclear annihilation to an entire country? How does that match up? Why don't, they, why don't they just go ahead, apply their terms of service and say, sorry guy, you messed up, get the hell out of here? Well, what Twitter actually does is that they hide behind a different set of rules. And they call it an enforcement policy. And they use that to determine whether what you did in violating the terms of service is okay or not. And in the case of Donald Trump, Twitter says, well, you know, it is violence, but the public might be interested in that. So if the public is interested in what this guy talks about, we're just not going to ban him. This entire policy gives them wiggle room in their solid ethics. And what I think what they did is that they traded ethics for market capitalization. Because um, Twitter never used to be profitable. They've been going on for 11 years before they made their first money. The actual the first quarter that Twitter made money was the fourth quarter of 2017. So 15 years, no, sorry, 11 years after they released their platform, they made money for the first time. Coincidentally, that was about a month after Donald Trump was elected the 45th president of the United States of America. That's weird. 2018 was Twitter's first profitable year in the company history. They never made money, but in 2018, they made money. And it just so turns out that they realize that people like Donald Trump hate spewing white supremacists on their platform actually make them money because they drive engagement. They bring people on their platform, and the more people they have on their platform, the more advertisements they can play, and the more money they make. So 
Why doesn't anyone at Twitter do anything about that? I mean, they have a lot of employees. Why doesn't anyone say anything? And um, there's a very nice quote. This guy, Upton Sinclair, um, he wrote a book in 1906 about the American meatpacking industry. <laughs> Turns out that uh, meat in America didn't used to be such a clean thing. They did a lot of shitty things with it. They repackaged it, they stored it in warm containers for four weeks, and they sold it to you. Um, he wrote a book about that. That book actually led to a lot of regulations regarding that, and it just so turns out that now you can actually eat American meat. It doesn't necessarily kill you instantly. Um, yeah, so Upton Sinclair, it is difficult to get a man to understand something when his salary depends on his not understanding it. And that is a lot of what's wrong with Twitter. Because the people that work there, they make money of it. They make a lot of money of it. Jack Dorsey is worth $5.7 billion. Why should he change anything about that? This <laughs> is a photo from 2017. Evan Reiser is um, one of the members of Twitter's product team. Actually, that is Jack Dorsey right there, by the way. Did you notice anything about that photo? Anything? There's not a single woman on that photo. This is the entire tech lead team of Twitter. There's not a single woman in that photo. And when you think about that, you might realize that you can somehow understand why they do the things they do them, uh, why they do the things in the way that they do them. Because if you've never been on the receiving end of harassment or abuse or violence, you don't necessarily notice those things. You don't, they don't appear on your radar. And if all the experience you have is from 30 something, well, there's one Asian guy, but 30 something white guys in the prime of their years making a lot of money, you're not going to worry about that. And it's not just Twitter that is that way. Actually, there's, um, there's, a, there's a word they call it bro culture in, in tech. Bro culture is when you get a lot of your white bros and you do something and you make a lot of money of it. That's how they call it. And this bro culture has led to the, to the effect that people are pushing stuff to markets that are ne not necessarily good for those markets because they never think about the other cases. They're going to look at you and say, like, dude, why, why don't you care about, I don't know, racism against black people on your platform? And they will tell you, well, that's an edge case. Like, what they mean when they say it's an edge case, they mean I don't care about it or I've never heard about it. And what they're actually saying is I don't care, I, I don't care enough about that group of people to worry about it. So they make a conscious decision to ignore a certain part of their user base for the sake of simplicity. But those decisions can have disastrous effects. You know, there's, I mean, we all, we all work with edge cases. Like, I don't necessarily always worry about Internet Explorer 9 when I develop websites. That's, that's what I consider an edge case. But the thing about edge cases is that they don't scale very well. Like, if you have 100 customers, a 1% Edge case margin, it's okay, it's, it's one person that, mm, I don't know, doesn't get to experience the wonderful plastic toys that you make. But if you're Facebook and your user base is 1.6 billion people, that 1% margin suddenly is 160 million people and you still treat them as edge cases. Oop, that was one too much again. What they do is they treat the protection of their, uh, of their vulnerable group user groups as an afterthought. They don't think about it beforehand. They think about it afterwards, maybe. I mean, Twitter implemented some sort of reporting mechanism where you can just click a button and, like, this guy is a dick. <laughs> um, but um, what happens when you don't think about that beforehand, but only afterwards, is this. Um, there, was an, there was an incident in Frankfurt a couple of days ago where a woman was pushed onto uh, railroad tracks by, um, by a guy from Eritrea. I don't know what's called in English, Eritrea. Um, and it didn't take very long, and I mean that in it took about five minutes before the first people were spewing racism over, over the platform, telling them to go home and hoarding up groups of people by certain ethnic uh, details. 
And so I sometimes, when I have a little time left, go through my Twitter feed, try to look for certain hashtags, and start reporting people. It's what I do for fun. It's like I report racists on Twitter. It's kind of my hobby. Um, and it's all nice. The thing is, uh, Germany just uh, recently implemented um, a certain set of laws that were um, targeted to reduce hate online and to enable authorities to easier follow up on those cases. It's called the Netzwerkdurchsuchungsgesetz. You've probably all heard of that. Sorry. Netzwerkdurchsetzungsgesetz. I'm sorry. It's a very long word. It's a German word. Um, and what happened when this law was put into place was that Twitter had to change their reporting dialogue. Um, they now need to differentiate what kind of laws you were violating when, when you spew racism on the platform. And so you say, oh, I'm going to report this racist, and then you're greeted with this. This is uh, one, two, three, four, five, eight. it's eight different paragraphs written into uh, certain um, criminal, criminal codes that describe different criminal activities. And now I, as the user who's just trying to report a racist, is forced, uh, I'm forced to make a decision, like, what law is he violating? And, and I'm not a lawyer. I'm, I'm, I'm nothing of the kind. Um, but I have to know which criminal code was violated to report that user. There's no way around that. I have to click one of those buttons. And after I've done that, I'm like, okay, well, it's probably going to be Gewaltdarstellung, which means display of violence in English. Um, the next screen you're greeted with is this. This is actually only half of it. This is sort of like the, the terms of service of reporting a user on Twitter. And, and I'm sorry, it's only in German because actually those pages only exist in Germany. Reporting dialogues in, in other countries are different, and I wanted to show you that. Um, this is an interesting part. What it says is, when I report this user, and I, I translated that, I understand that the reported user will be notified and that this issue will be forwarded to the Lumen database shown in the Twitter transparency report and can be added to legally required public reports and reports to authorities. What does that mean? I don't know. But what I think it means is that the user I just reported for being a racist gets a notification that says, hey, Michel just reported you because you're a racist. Um, it also, I think, means that there could be public reports of, hey, Michel reported that racist for being a racist. I don't, I don't necessarily want that because I don't want to put my identity out when I try to work against those people. It's, an, it's, it's a form of protection for myself. I don't want to be publicized for what I do in that, in that regard. And for me, it's just like, I don't want to be known to racist, but if you are, for example, a woman that has been sexually harassed on the platform, the worst thing that can happen to you is, your, is if your abuser finds out that you did something about that. It just leads to more harassment and to more stalking, and it puts you in actual physical danger. So you don't want that. So why is it written that way? It's written that way because they didn't think about it this beforehand. Because if they had set up their platform in a way that prevents those people from entering your platform and from prevents those people from getting a public voice, they wouldn't have to have put those long thingies in there. Like they could say, "Oh, well, that's probably a racist post. We're just gonna go, we're just gonna delete that." Um, and this this bias is apparent in a lot of platforms. Um, Amazon tried to streamline their recruiting. They're recruiting by using an AI. It just so turns out if you get a bunch of white dudes to develop an AI to do your recruiting for you, they're probably only going to find other white dudes. Um, they realize that, they scrap the tool, but it just shows how, how little we think about those other groups in the things we do. This is um, just... <laughs> just so you realize that this is not necessarily only a tech problem. This was published um, because of International Women's Day. This is a German uh, real estate company, and the five white guides in their board of directors talks about International Women's Day and what women have been an influence on them. Actually, please don't read that article because it is horrendous. It is sexist to the brink. Don't read it. It's horrible. But the thing is, we have an, we have an actual issue with that in our community. 
We don't care about other groups. We don't care about women. We don't hire women. And we look at our all-guy all teams and think, well, this is okay. Maybe the women just don't want to participate. Well, actually, they do, but we just don't give a shit. Um, and once they start working for us, they're actually having a really hard time. We belittle them. We don't take them seriously because, well, they're women. And those of you that saw Florian's talk, yes, uh, talk yesterday, he talked a lot about empathy and how we as designers, or he said they as designers, they work with empathy. They're very empathetic people, and I, I support that. I'm, I'm pretty sure that he's a very empathetic person. But empathy is not a valid substitute for diversity. You can't empathize every edge case. You just don't know about them. You've never heard of them. Why should you empathize with something that you've never heard of? And I am probably guilty of that myself. I have an inherent bias because I am who I am. And the products that I develop and that I design, they, have, they carry that bias. And there's nothing I can do about it. It's, it's not inherently wrong to be like that. It's just how I am. But what if on my team there were, for example, a woman that has a completely different inherent bias, that maybe thinks about violence against women, that maybe thinks about sexual abuse on, on certain platforms, why don't we realize that this is a very valuable asset? That it's a very valuable asset to have someone from another culture, from another country on our team that can just open up different perspectives on the things we do. Um, you know, there's... Oh, oh still there. Um, having inherent bias is not world's end, I guess. I mean, it's... I mean, it's uncomfortable when you're developing like a news platform and you have people from countries that read from right to left and reading from right to left breaks your layout. Okay, you didn't think about that. You didn't have anyone on your team that reads from right to left or has ever read, has ever read? read from right to left. That's a minor inconvenience. But if you don't have a person on your team that thinks about, hey, if we do this platform, maybe we'll get a shit ton of Nazis on our platform, and they're going to spew hate, and they're going to be ma mean to women, and they're going to sexually harass people. And in that case, as I said before, your inherent bias becomes a deadly, uh, becomes a deadly problem because it actually kills people. People are victims of violence, and they get hurt from that. Do you trust doctors to do their job right? Like, if you go to a doctor and it's like, oh, I have this, I don't know, ache in my belly, can you do something about that? You probably do. Why do you do that? Because in, whoa, this is really weird. Um, in a, let's call it a Western civilization, you can be pretty sure that this doctor went through a thorough process of learning what he does. He has gone through numerous exams, he's passed lots of tests, written tests, he has a lot of experience that he did under supervision. And uh, no, probably most of you drive sometimes. You don't think about the bridges you drive over and think, oh, maybe that civil engineer was, I don't know, um, a baker before and he just went on and built bridges. Um, you don't do that because you trust in those professions because they have a certain code of ethics, they have a certain way of educating themselves that makes you trust in them. You trust doctors, right? You trust doctors with your private data because you give them a lot of your private data when you go to a doctor. Your health is a very, very sensible topic. So, Elon Musk goes ahead and builds a device that you can implant into your brain and read your brain waves. That seems like rather private data, doesn't it? Do you trust developers they'll do your job right? I've heard this saying a lot, like, if you work in tech long enough, you stop trusting your colleagues. Like, you don't, you don't trust developers. Why do you do that? Because we don't know what we do. We don't have a certain, we, have, we don't have a code of ethics for development. There's no such thing as a Hippocratic Oath for developers. Um, and to be quite honest, we didn't prove ourselves to be very trustworthy over the last years. I mean, we've built platforms that can threaten nuclear annihilation to a bunch of people. Why should people trust us? We, as developers, need to make sure that 
people can actually trust in us. We need to come up with a certain set of standards or a, a code of ethics that enables people to trust in us and enables people to trust us with their data and their health data. And to get to that point, I actually I brought two words with me today. It's only two words. First one is why. I want you to use that word as often as possible. I want you to go into meetings when you talk about products, when you talk about things you develop, and use that word as much as possible. Why are we building the product that we are building? And why are we building it in a way, in the way that we are building it? And why is it so important to use that word? Because this is really annoying. Because you don't actually work for your client. This might sound rather weird. Like, I mean, you have a contract, right? But most of you have contracts. If you don't have contracts, make contracts. And while you're at it, get a lawyer, because this is going to bite you in the ass. Um, but still, you are contractually obliged by your client to do the work that you want to do. But it just so turns out that you actually don't work for your client. You work for their customers. Because what your client does is look for a person that they think can do their job right. And they look for a person that has the necessary expertise and the, necessarily, uh, the necessary skills to develop a project. And that's us. We are those people that bring the expertise and the skills and that actually put the systems into place. Because you're, so you're hired because you're the best for the job that they want to have. But you're not hired to please them you're hired to develop a product that is good for your customers, uh, for your client's customers, I'm sorry. And it just turns out that you are actually in some way responsible for, for, your, customer, uh, for your client's customers because you know what you do. You know what you put into place. You know the systems you develop. And so you are responsible for making sure that those systems don't hurt anyone. And what really helps in asking the why questions is trying to follow the money. For example, if you are a developer at Twitter and you're told, well, uh, please implement an enforcement policy that states that we can leave Donald Trump on this platform. Maybe if someone would have tried to figure out why you should do that, um, maybe we wouldn't have that today. And to figure out why you should do something, you can follow the money because it leads to very interesting uh, it leads to very interesting things, because if you would have followed the money at Twitter, you would at some place found out, uh, at some time found out that there's actually a bunch of white, va white venture capitalists that try to make money off the platform. And if you don't know your stakeholders or your client's stakeholders, you will never know their motives. And if you don't know your client's motives, you don't really want to do that. Like, you don't want to develop something that you don't know what it's used for. In order to ask those questions, you, as a developer, need to demand a seat at the table. You need to be where decisions are made. You need to be in the room when people decide to implement those products and, to, to, and when people decide to implement those enforcement policies. You need to be there, because if you're not there, you cannot ask the questions. And once you're, on the once you're at the table, once you are in a place where you can ask the why questions, there's a time to use the second word I'm going to give to you today, which is no. It's a very simple word, but it's a very powerful word. Because when we say no, there's not much we can, there's not much, um, for example, our employees can do. If I say no, I'm not going to do that, what's he going to do? Fire me? Okay, I'm going to find a new job. There is, um, for some reason, everyone thinks that we need to be humble. We don't want to speak up. We don't want to be loud. We, want, we don't want to be the person that disturbs a certain flow of things. We want to be humble. But I think being humble just means you're, you're afraid. Humble is just a wrapper for fear. But if you're humble, and if you stay behind, and you don't open your mouth, and you don't sit at the table, you can never change anything. You cannot prevent companies from implementing things that are bad. And I've, I've fallen victim to this myself a lot. Uh, the thing that's called imposter syndrome. 
You heard that before? It's when you sit in a room and you talk about things and you're like you're sitting there and you're wondering why am I here? It's like who thought that I was qualified to be here? Um it's a very bad feeling. I hate it very much and it it, it gets me a couple of times a year. Um but turns out imposter syndrome is bullshit. It's a big big steaming pile of bullshit. You know why? There is I mean uh, in the case of imposter syndrome there is two possible reasons. One of those reasons or the possible reason is that everyone, every single person you've worked for up until this point in time is a complete idiot. Because they never figured out that you're an imposter. It's like they saw you and thought, oh, that person might just be smart because, because they're dumb. Or the other reason might just be that you're actually as good as everyone thinks. It might just so happen that you're not as stupid as you think and that where you are is actually the right place for you to be right now. And it's the right place for you to change things. If someone hired you, they did it for a reason. They probably did it because you are a good developer. And that gives you a lot of power that we don't necessarily realize. You have a lot of power when you're a developer. You just need to use it. You need to get the seat at the table. You need to ask the questions, why are we doing this? Why are we doing that? Why are we doing it the way we are doing it? And you need to say no. And you have the power to say no, and no one's going to hate you for it. They're going to be annoyed, but they're not going to hate you, and they're not going to fire you. No one is going to fire you for saying no. We need to stand up and fight. Fight against companies that try to abuse our users' data and try to make people's lives hell by implementing policies that allows racists on their platform. And occasionally you hear someone say, well, yeah, I work for, for Uber and I developed Grayball and I, I tricked authorities um, into believing that we're a good company. But on the weekends, I work for a small foundation that, I don't know, helps kids in Africa or something. Just doing something on the weekends, it doesn't balance out what you did over the course of the week. There is no karmic wheel in development. Don't make up for shitty things you do with good things you do at other times. You need to stand up. You need to fight every time. Every time someone tries to implement something that is bad, stand up and fight. Don't just do it on the weekend. I mean, still, go do open source work. It's a really good thing. It's good you're here. But that doesn't make up for shit you do on other days. You need to make people aware of, of your power, of your stand, and of the, of, the, of the ethical values that you have. You need to do that. And maybe that just means to get up and leave. What if you're in a company that is so toxic and so stupid that they don't realize what they're doing that you can't fix anything? Well, get up and leave. Just leave. Because doing shady things might be nice for short-term gains, but it doesn't give you, it doesn't give you long-term employment just because you, for one time, developed Grayball. Realize that you, when you work for a shitty company, that company doesn't give a shit about you. They don't care about you. They want money. If you would have followed the money, you would have known that. But if you realize that you're in a company like that, just get up. Leave. Because you know you have the power and you have the skills, because you're not an imposter, to get a new job. You can get a new job where you can get where you can do good things. And you can still go build websites for African children on the weekend. But at least you're doing a good thing in your first job. We, as developers, need to take care of the world around us because we have power. We do great things. We do good things. We do a lot of good things, but we do bad things too. And we, as developers, need to be gatekeepers. We need to be the ones that say, no, I'm not going to do this. We are not going to do this because this is bad. And we are strong. We need to remember that. And maybe if more of us started caring about other people and more of us started working in more diverse and inclusive teams, maybe we wouldn't have stuff like that. Maybe we just need to care about the people that we work for. If you want to uh, dive into those topics a little more, I brought you a couple of um, books that I encourage you to read. They are really good. The first one, Ruined by Design, actually makes up a lot of my talk. 
So if you want to follow up on the things that I told you about, read Rune by Design by Mike Montero. He's a great guy. Um, design for the real world is a good example of what designing and developing should be. Rotopia talks a lot about white dudism in Silicon Valley cultures. And just for the heck of it, read The Jungle from Upton Sinclair. Uh, Upton Sinclair. It's a very great book. And that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Great talk. Um, we have five minutes more left to any questions you guys have. So are there any questions? You can raise your hand. I'll come to you and give you the microphone. Yes. Um, I like the idea about the diversity very much. I think this would really work. What I don't understand is how, do you have ideas how to get the diversity at the table? Well, I mean, we, we're stuck in a, in a rather bad place because we've fought for dude culture for so long that we are actually having a hard time getting women and minorities um, to, our schools, to, to try to become developers. And we need to work on all levels of education and all levels of work to encourage people that are outside of our personal scope to, to join our teams. We need to advertise the stuff that we do. And a lot of it actually starts in schools. So we need, to, we need to take great care of the people we educate, and we need to encourage women to go into tech jobs because they're desperately needed, because we don't have enough. So I don't have like that one solid solution, but I'm pretty sure if we started way at the bottom and followed up with that all the way to the top, we might just change a little bit. Any other questions? Um, what's your opinion on forced diversity versus natural diversity? To be honest, we didn't show that we're capable of doing it the other way. And I mean, we did that with a lot of things, like we showed that we're not capable of valuing people's privacy, so we got hit with the GDPR. And it's a good thing. So it's, that's the, the thing about trusting us. People cannot trust us because we didn't, we didn't prove trustworthy. So maybe we actually need regulations to try to encourage diversity. I don't know if there is, if, if having like a 50 50 split between men and women is a smart thing, especially because there's no such thing as a clear cut between men and women. So that's probably shitty. But, um, yeah, maybe we need some sort of regulation to, to do that. So, forced quotas, Trump expertise, and experience in a job, or that, the, no, the wish of an individual to go into tech, go into STEM, what have you? The problem is that we don't care about expertise. We care about what's between your legs. We, we do that a lot. We do that inherently. We're biased. And so just, uh, I, I don't believe that there is, th that, that there is so many more well-educated men in tech than there are women. I don't believe that. And we, we always hide behind that. Well, yeah, but what if a man comes and he's super cool and he knows all the things? Well, then, for God's sake, hire him. But also hire that woman that's next to him that's ex equally as experienced as he is, but we don't care about her. So I, th I think we hide behind this myth of, well, he's more experienced. Well, maybe he's not, but he has a dick. Just right quick in response to that, I think that 
forced diversity is a good response to forced separation and segregation against people of genders and colors for centuries. Um, but I do have a question. Um, Michael, is there anything that you've done that you're not proud of looking back? Is there anything that you've developed, you don't have to go into details, or that you're developing currently? Yes. Where you say, that sucks, I wish it was different? Yes, of course. Did you change anything about it? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Will ya? Uh, uh, no, I, I actually am... Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm, I'm not allowed to talk about that, that's a bad thing. Um, yes, yes, of course. I mean, I'm, I'm far from perfect, obviously. Well, I mean, but... I think um, you're pretty cool. I, I try to. I try, I try to change things that, that I think are bad. I, I try to work on the projects that I develop with, uh, that, I'm, that I'm working on, and I try to implement... <coughs> for example, I try to implement ways that prevent harassment on platforms. Like, I, I, I really feel that that is necessary, and so I, I actually used all those words in the discussions regarding that, and there were a couple of fights, and it was ugly, and it, I didn't like that, but in the end I pushed through. And it's not, it's, I mean, it's not a big thing that we did, but it's a small thing that makes life easier for people on the platform. And so, yeah. And you should too. I don't have a question, but maybe a remark. I don't really agree with the uh, last words. The no. Yeah. Trust me. If you are looking, <coughs> closer. Okay, is it okay now? The consequences are especially based on the last word you use, diversity. It has consequences. It's not the same every time. Okay. Yeah, I don't necessarily understand where you're going with that, but we can talk about that later. I really want to. I think further understand what you're saying because I don't really understand it right now. But let's talk about that. Um, okay. Um, any more questions? Yeah. Sure. Uh, great talk. Just uh, to say thank you uh, because um, it's not a common thing. Uh, people are not really um, nowadays talking about. Uh, these questions, diversity. Um, I think it is a solution. Divers diversity is the solution. We have to, to mix teams, we have to mix, we have to, to, to work together. To, there is um, some minority groups, we have to include them, we have to, 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 to work with them, and uh, just, just Yes, thank you. Yeah, it's great. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Um, okay, uh, are there any more questions? I know everybody can comment on this topic, but are there any more questions related to this topic you want to discuss right now in this talk? You want to tell, uh, talk to Michael? Um, just raise your hand. If there aren't, um, I'll be I'll be here until Sunday. So if you want to talk to me about the stuff, just hit me up. I'll I'll be glad to talk to you about that. And on this behalf, I'm just want to uh, apologize to uh, you for calling you a scruff master. I know you're a scrum master. <laughs> I just mixed it up. And I know how you feel about that. So I'm really sorry. Um, just rate this talk. Um, there's a bowl in the back, as in every other room. Uh, there are those tiles of paper on your seats. Uh, throw them in there. If anyone doesn't have one, there's a box with green, yellow, and red up here, and I can bring them to the door. And thank you very much. Now off to lunch. Thank you. Thank you.